I grew up like any normal kid. My father was a pilot, my mother was a businesswoman. I grew up in Westlands. My first school was in Consolata. And this is in the 70s. Later on, moved to Nairobi Primary. By the age of 13, after my CPE, I, I had a motorbike. When other, I had a sports motorbike. By the time other kids were getting bicycles, I had a sports bike. I'm a guy who's seen a good life. But ultimately, in the end, I was in the streets. So how does a child brought up in privilege eventually degenerate into living on the streets? That is the story I want to share with you today. I'm Solomon Gitao Kilanga. I'm an author. I've authored a book uh, called Chokora, My Life in Addiction. I'm a team leader at an organization uh, called GLC, where we rescue and rehabilitate adult men living on the streets. I want to demystify and hopefully remove the stigma that is associated to adult males living in the streets. Yeah, those guys you pass Kilasiku, they are just society derogatively calls them chokuras. Two, I want to speak to every Kenyan male, young and old, those that I see outside there, trying to seek solace in alcohol and drugs. Because there are no answers there. It may look like it provides temporary solutions. But believe me, the only thing that it will cause is massive pain, as will be evidenced in my story. But I also hope that this story, anybody who listens to me, anybody who's listening right now, and is going through pain, will come to realize at the end that it does not matter who caused the wound that you're suffering from. The wound is yours. doesn't matter. It, quit the blame game. Whether it was parents, whether it was who, whether it was who, whether it was who. Just quit the blame game because the wound is yours and you have to deal with it. So basically, yeah, those are the things that I hope to achieve through telling of the story. Now let me go to my story. It's because of circumstances and events that happened. I've led a very interesting life. Because other than those positive things I said, I am also a recovering alcoholic and a one-time homeless street man. Those guys that society calls chokuras, I have lived as one of them. And I want to point out to you that uh, this can happen to anybody. Because first of all, let's go back to my background. I grew up like any normal kid. My father was a pilot. My mother was a businesswoman. I grew up in Westlands. My first school was in Consolata. And this is in the 70s. Later on, moved to Nairobi Primary. By the age of 13, after my CPE, I, I had a motorbike. When other, I had a sports motorbike. By the time other kids were getting bicycles, I had a sports bike. I'm a guy who's seen a good life. But ultimately, in the end, I was in the streets. I also lived in the streets. I began drinking at 13. By 18, I was an addict. By 31, I was living in the streets. I didn't even go to the streets as a chokora. This total chokora, you see. I went there at the age of 31, having lived a successful life. So how does a child brought up in privilege eventually degenerate into living on the streets? That is the story I want to share with you today. And the pain and misery that goes on in the streets so that you may better understand that street community. At the age of 13, I never drank in my life. But at the age of 13, we were a bunch of us, you know, just a, a few schoolboys. Those days, it was days of Nairobi show. We had Nairobi show ground and, uh, you know, we're just about to get to 13. We've just finished our standard seven, our CPE. 
ah, we're beginning to feel mature, we're beginning to feel like we're going to be men now. And so one of us dares the others, let's have a drink. And we say, okay. Of course, we're too young even to go and order for ourselves the alcohol, so we get the older brother of a friend of ours to order for us. And this guy brings us a crate of beer. We sit somewhere kind of, he brings us a packet of cigarettes, and uh, we, are, we are kids, but now we've never drunk before. But, uh, you know, since the bet is on, we fungu our, our drinks. And, uh, of course, we look at each other as we take our first sips. Then you bring the cigarettes in and you take a puff of smoke. You cough almost your entire lungs out. But again, you're trying to be a man. Anyway, long story short, I don't even think we drank that much, probably only three beers. And those were those two small beers of Kitambo, the call to Tusca exports. So we drank only about three beers. But I'll tell you this, when the effect of, al of that alcohol came, the feeling I got was a feeling of invincibility. That is the only word I can use to describe the feeling I got. For the first time in my life, I felt I loved myself. For the first time in my life, I had a heightened sense of self-esteem. For the first time in my life, I felt I could be anything. I was lovable. And that was the feeling I would chase until it landed me in the streets. That false sense of joy or self-esteem and other things that I did not have in me, that alcohol gave me, became the thing I would chase until I lived in the streets. Let's take a look at that picture. Here is a 13-year-old kid, posh school, lived in posh neighborhoods, parents are well off, why would a 13-year-old at that stage have such a low sense of self-esteem that they would need a drug, alcohol or any other drug, to make them feel lovable? That is something we will come back to because it is happening in many households today. Our youth are getting lost and from the outside society we keep on saying, what haven't we done for them? We have paid school fees. They're in expensive schools. They're in this, they're in that, they're in this. We are doing this, that, that, the other. Parents, money does not answer everything. But we will get back to that. Now I was 13, guys are getting bicycles. I got a motorcycle. And uh, suddenly I was catapulted to another level above my peers. Because now you have a motorbike. First of all, I didn't like hanging out with uh, my age mates. 13 year olds seemed a bit kiddish to me at the time. So I wanted to hang out with guys who were older. And the older guys also saw in me, uh, you know, a source of transport. Oh, you have a motorbike. These guys want to go see their girlfriends. They want to go to drink or stuff like that. They, you'll use your motorbike. So we began, became friends, began to hang out with older guys. Remember, older guys had good access to money and alcohol. So me and my pocket money runs out, eh? Ah, these guys always have money. So now from one, you're just, you know, you're drinking. Uh, from one, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you've upped your life. You know, your girlfriends are from two, from three, Nauko. And uh, you think you're living a pretty good life. By from two, second term, I was expelled from school. By then I was in Upper Hill. I was expelled, not suspended, expelled. Because of my land attendance, my lateness, my what, you know, the insubordination, you name it all, you know. And when I was expelled uh, in Form 2, I never, Form 2 second term, I never let my parents know. I didn't tell them what was I going to tell them. I had freedom. Because for me, uh, where we lived, other than the main house, there was uh, an attached servant's quarters outside. It's a self-contained thing. So the, our house help didn't live in the servant quarters. They lived in the house. I lived in the SQ. Because now I'm, the, I'm you know, trying to be given uh, you know, 
think you know you're in secondary but there's some responsibility danini now and of course you have a, a stone wall around the compound and one common gate so you your parents think they're in control nobody knows your, your timings your movements you will see your parents just once once in a while you don't have to see them daily and second term went third term of form two nobody still knew that i had been kicked out and for the entire third term of form two i continued faking like i was going to school but now even i was getting worried hey now it's coming to form three when i was starting to wonder hey, what will happen when i when we go to the next class i can't keep on not being in school luckily my father found out and uh, i don't know how he found out but one day he just came to me and he told me hey we are going on a trip somewhere he didn't make noise he didn't do anything rash he just came and told me you know we're going on a trip i said okay and uh, you know anything was better than the situation that i was in ah so next day uh go to isili go we catch some old for for then some some old taxi uh, matatus for for five of us that used to take guys to uh, isiolo so we are on this journey for you know, two three hours wondering where you are going by then i was not told where i'm going just told we're going on safari And eventually at the end of that safari so you land in Siolo the hottest place i've ever been in hey, you land there, in there you get there in the afternoon that's a hot place even the, it was the hottest place i knew in kenya well i'd ever been to in kenya oh we sleep over in the next day we go to what was then called the barrier now at that time isiolo from from isiolo to masabit there was no tarmac Those were the 80s. These are days there was the shifter bandits and stuff. So <coughs> lorries would line up there, uh, lorries taking stuff to uh, Masabit, uh, Moyale and beyond. They would line up there. And uh, you know they, they then you they have to have a car escort of administration police. So sir, we get on this on these uh, lorries And for the next those days Masabit you left Isiolo at 11 about 10 10 in the morning or 11 there you get to Masabit at about 11 or midnight. So when we go to Masabit it was it was dark. We just went to a friend of my father's place and we spent the night. But now next day you come out uh, to see the town and you are taken to see the school. And I can tell you the moment I saw Masabit town I hated it. I'm being taken to a school. I'm actually shown the school, but this is a school in a town that looks like a scene from a bad western movie. Those two one horse towns, Masabit was remote. Masabit was not a ca- <laughs> All right, it was like a remote place. And me basically I decided this would be a one stop drinking center and that's it. I was not coming here to study. By the way, over the next two years it was just a drinking place but now into the mix i found mira kilo i found there some good changa uko kienda manyata za borana uko in masabit the two hills there ah, you find some very good changa so let's just put it this way i was lucky that after two years in masabit i didn't extremely ruin my life but when i came out of there i was an alcoholic i was dependent on alcohol came back to Nairobi uh went to a college here studied clearing and forwarding and some business administration there used to be a college at Menti House called Universal College in those days when studied uh, clearing and forwarding uh, business administration as soon as the clearing and forwarding was I was done with I quickly went and interned for a job in a short in a few months I knew my way around and I could begin to make money So now begins the story of now you are making money. But you are my only plan as a youth was this. Make money, drink. Make money, have more fun. Make money, drink again at infinitum. And I didn't have a major plan. I didn't have a plan about creating wealth. I didn't have a plan for that kind of thing. And over the next few years my life just kept on being ruined more 
and more. What I thought was fun, I was a functioning alcoholic. I would drink up to five in the morning and go and do my shuglis, then go back to the bar in the evening. Alcohol never interfered with the ability to be able to go out and make something, some more money so that you can come and drink some more alcohol. So in my own words, I would say I was a functional alcoholic, like so many are today. And maybe, maybe my story may have just ended there as a functional alcoholic, but it didn't. So time goes by and you're continuing to drink and uh, your relatives, your family, people are reaching out to you. And people are really asking you, you know, why do you drink? Why can't you stop this stuff? Why, why, why do you need tafadhali banas? You are kitu, you know, that kind of thing. You know, because the people who see you drinking, alcohol is viewed, or drugs, they are viewed in two different ways. There is the way the person who is seeing you consume it is viewing it. They are seeing what it is doing to you, the dents, the, you know, all that they see it do, do to you. But you are not seeing it from that way. You are seeing, you the user are seeing what it does for you, for you, the self-esteem, the feeling of loving yourself, the feeling of being worthy. That is what it is doing for you. And that is what, that is why we look at this thing in two different ways. So, so, so people keep on insisting, you know, and you keep on isolating people. Well, I was arrogant, you know, so one of my, one of the things I would ask people is, am I drinking your money? Yes, so you isolate people. Keep on isolating people until you are eventually left with only a small group of friends. And these guys you are left with are the guys that you drink with. Now, these guys, you don't know them beyond, you don't know their houses, you don't know where they live. Basically, what you do is you meet up in the bars with these guys. You have no other social life with them. But every evening or every time you go to a bar, these are the guys you meet, you buy each other a few rounds, you commiserate in your misery together there. Of course, at that time you don't know it's misery. At that time you're thinking it's great joy you are having over there. And each of you leaves. If one guy doesn't come tomorrow, nobody finds out where they went. Another miserable soul will join you there. Now I can call them miserable souls. At that time I thought it was a great thing to have and be doing with these guys. But time goes on. You have isolated everyone who loved you. You have put everyone who cared for you is out of your life. In this crowd that you are in, you share nothing in common. And now you start getting lonely. Now you realize that you are actually lonely in that crowd. Now you start searching for, for me, I started searching. I, I really, I wanted somebody to love me. And this thought of finding somebody who would love me unconditionally, slowly from a thought began to become an obsession. And every day I dwelt on it, it became stronger. Until in my, I'll say, crazed alcoholic mind of the time, I clearly decided that the only person who could love me unconditionally would be my own child. And that cause I thought of a son. You know now, <laughs> Alcoholics, we can be very selfish. I, I wanted, now I decided, I want a child. Because to your child, you are daddy. To your child, you're not the loser society is saying you are. To your child, you're not the al alcoholic that, you are, you're, uh, that people are saying you are. To your child, you are simply daddy and that kid loves you. But here is the other side. I'm not thinking what I can do for this child. I'm just thinking what this child can do for me. But now again, you look at the logistics and you realize you're not amoeba. And a woman is necessary for the mix. And so I went in search, you know, you have to marry. So I went in search of, of a woman. But this was not anything to do with love issues. If I had known, I would probably 
never have taken that direction. You see, I really want this story to point out that there are many places in life where I could have gotten help. There are many places in life where I might have changed my direction from where it is now heading. But now this was actually a stage. The step I was taking would actually be a step that would lead me closer to going to become a street person. So now that I have to find a woman, I decided to find, you know, the women we drank with. My <laughs> friend, you don't marry those ones. You know, the women you hang around in bars with, you don't marry those ones. So, this is the story of the pot calling the kettle black lakini. For one thing, for sure, the women you drink with in bars and hang around with in bars, at most, they would be for temporary relief or to black out reality for a short while, but not marriage, but not marriage material. It's always been said, and even then it was said, good girls come from church, so why do you go looking for a wife? But I went to church to look for a wife. And I went, went to a church where I thought, you know, get a proper wife, you know, born again Christian and all. Now, the thing is, and I will mention this for the viewers, so that people realize this. Churches are the places where people are most vulnerable. Because I can walk up to you in a church, and as so long as I'm within the church compound, I can strike up a conversation with anyone. If I can say, the, the, you know, speak the way they are all speaking there, everyone will embrace me. You hug strangers in churches, people you wouldn't talk to outside there. So that's a place where people are vulnerable. And uh, that's where I decided I'll go look for a wife. So... Now I'm a guy who's not shy, I don't like things to say. And so when I went looking for a wife, I quickly, I went to the church, I scanned, I quickly identified my target, and got a conversation going later on. Of course, you're not going to immediately engage, but you, you're in a church. So you talk about the church, the building, what the sermon was like and stuff like that. But then you turn this conversation to a hypothetical situation whereby if we were suited for each other, how long would it take? And so the girl gives me an answer, you know, the pastor, the blessings, I don't know what, what, what. And I'm thinking, man, time frame. With all that, it might take a year. I walked out of the church one year. I wanted to be married like last week. Why would I wait around for one year? And so began the next Sunday, went to another church, no success. But I'll tell you this, if you look for something in this world, good or bad, but you search for it hard enough and with all your heart, you're going to find it. And I was on Sunday, I was coming back home, the compound where I lived, at the gate, I meet this girl, and uh, she's coming out of the compound, and I'm going in. I say, hi, hi. Why don't you come in for a cup of tea? And she says, okay. So we go in. This is about four o'clock. In three hours, by seven o'clock, we had courted, we had married, we had consummated the marriage, and she was moving in three hours later. And for me, you know, the things one does in desperation. For me, I said, hallelujah, the heavens have blessed me. The universe has acceded to, my to what I wanted because I had wanted this. I just wanted this vessel. But I never asked myself, how desperate could she have been in three hours to enter into this relationship and come and stay with a man within three hours? So one year down the road, one day, um, sit, um, at Nyamakema, at that time we were doing some electronics business at Nyamakema area, and I'm thinking, ah, I think I've got money, why don't I just go home, you know, surprise this girl, surprise this girl, take out with uh, her son, you know, we've never even gone out. And I go home, it's a uh, sato, I get home about one o'clock, so I go into my place, and, and I open the sitting room door, it's open. I go, I hear noises in the bedroom, I open the bedroom door, and there in front of me is my so-called wife naked in bed at 1 p.m. with another guy having sex. You know, I've just told, I just told you that I'm a guy who never lacks words. That day I lacked. So there was nothing to say. You know, there are things you just look at, you can't comprehend it. It's not so much the issue of 
that there was any love there. It's just that thing of seeing you had built around a certain plan for a whole year, it has just crumbled down. By the time they realized I was there and uh, got up to look at me, there was nothing I could say, and I, I walked out. Went to the local bar, drank there, came back in the evening. By evening, they were gone. Now, in all my time that we lived around there, I'd never drank in the local bars. But now for the next three days, I didn't have the will even to go to town. So I hung around the local bars drinking. And let me tell you something. If you are going, if there's something bad happening in your life, everybody spoke where you knows it. Every, where I went drinking, I got drunk and started sharing with another guy in the bar. And then the guy tells me, hey, And everyone knows there, but now this, what is happening? That this, this woman and the guy I found her in bed with, these guys have been on and off for several years. Even he, he is the father of that child. You know those useless relationships that never really go anywhere. They break up, they come together, they break up, they come together. So what had happened is, at the time when I met this woman, she had broken up with this guy and she was lacking rent and was about to be thrown out. So as soon as I proposed, even as she said, hallelujah, the heavens have opened for her. So it was, you know, two desperados meeting and of course it can only end in disaster. So that was a milestone. Because from there, of course, I hung around those three days. I went to ask, what did I think? What did I do? I spent three days thinking about the various ways I could murder her. I could use a machete. I could put a knife into her. I could do. But then you realize that all those things are pointless. Best thing is to walk away and never come back. So when she came back three days later, I got out of that house and I went. I did not take, I only took my documents and the clothes on my back and I went to Isili. That was a milestone. I did not want, and that was the thing that directly started leading me towards a life in the streets. I, after that experience, I didn't want any kind of permanency. So I stayed in lodgings. But the problem is, I couldn't now handle what had just happened. And so I doubled, tripled, eventually almost quadrupled what I had been drinking before. And now I moved from a functional alcoholic who could drink and go and search for resources to a dysfunctional alcoholic who just drank until either the money ran out or until I collapsed. I had to start living a cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper life. From those expensive lodgings, you go to cheaper lodgings, cheaper lodgings. Cut a long story short, in a, in a span of time, I was pretty broke. One day I was going around the city, uh, just looking for a cheap lodging, cheap accommodation. And I found a place which was Cheap at that time, because I walked into a place and I was told a bed is 60 bob. Now those ones are those rooms, you know, it's a room, it has three beds, a bed is 60 bob, 60 bob each, That's, the owner makes 180 bob. But for me that was a cheap option. And I said, thank you, Lord. Mimi ni kanza kuishi huko. 60 bob you pay one, two days, but as kumbili you look across, you see that bed, they are sleeping two guys. This bed, they are sleeping two guys. I, Boss, what's happening over here? I'll translate that way. Why don't you pay 30 shillings and use half the bed? You know, there are places in this town that can shock you with the kind of life that happens. Now, this bed has two bed sheets, two blankets. So, actually, when you pay 30 bob, you take one blanket, one bed sheet. One guy puts his head, and the other guy puts his head this side. You use your shoes, you put them under the, you put the, your shoes under the, the, the mattress. They serve both as your pillow, and they, 
it is security so that they are not stolen. Eh? Because these are just places that are filled with to drunks and to drug addicts and that kind of thing. Now, I want to show you a, an economic slide for people who are going down this road of alcohol. For me, how it went. You've now found a place to sleep for 30 bob. So, if you have a place to sleep for 30 bob, uh, now, in this place where you are, you are sleeping now, it's cheap accommodation, so you're no longer drinking expensive alcohol. You don't even think about Kinataskaban. Now, you have found guys here in these accommodations, so now you've started going to Madare. You go to drink uh, you know, pure stuff from Madare, but Madare has become cumbersome, so tukaja hivi, tukachaga hata na hiyo ya Madare. Tukai kunyo kunyo ya Madare, alafu tukaja mpaka hapa isili, nikaja kujua a product which is the scum of all alcohol. A product, they call it karubu. And anybody, even the guys who drink changa, which is pretty despised, but at least it's popular. Karubu is the scum of alcohol. Karubu is a drink. Nobody serves you in a cup. Because even to the, the customers who, who now go to drink that, eh, they are not worthy of being served in a plastic cup. You are that low. Because that thing is served in kasuku tins. The owners of, of Karobu bars, they go to places, they pick up those tins, those uh, plastic uh, mikebes of kasukus. And that is what they sell the drink to us in. So if Kamali now, you are getting Karobu, and Karobu costs eight shillings. Eight shillings, shilling inane. Three of those, three of those mikebes are potent. You will get drunk. So basically, you can get drunk on twenty-four shillings. You have a place where you can sleep for thirty shillings. Every that is fifty-four shillings. You smoke, but you smoke the cheapest brands, like a brand called Rocket. It costs fifty cents. Rocket is those two kind of cigarettes you cannot smoke in one go. At the whole thing. Hey, you know, and younger like three times. So <laughs> you, you buy, when you buy for six bob, that's 12 of them, 24 hour supply. So the alcohol and the cigarettes is 30. The accommodation is 30. You are a guy who doesn't eat much. So food of 40 bob is enough. You probably eat one meal a day. Because you also don't want to eat too much, it doesn't interfere with the, with the absorption of alcohol into your bloodstream, but you want to be high. Hey, you know, I notice that uh, alcoholics don't like eating too much because they, they don't want it interfering with their level of highness. So you, come, you have now come down to a place where you require a hundred shillings to survive. Slowly, slowly from that, you, you don't you no longer think about a lot of money. You don't even think about looking for 150. No. Once you have 100 shillings, by whatever means you get it, you go hustle. Once you have 100, you are back in the city to drink that stuff. You know you'll sleep, you'll eat, and you'll be high. Next day you'll go hustle, find another 100 shillings, it is. As I want to make something very clear here. Those bars, you know, those bars, Karobo bars are places where you enter holding your nose. They stink. You actually enter when you are holding your nose. But once you get into there, uh, after a few drinks, you are acclimatized and uh, <laughs> you, 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 you stop. So at that point in time, I never believed. I had seen street men. I had seen chocolates. But I had always thought that these were mentally ill people. Something had to be wrong mentally. No sane person uh, with, a, with a mind can go and live on the streets. So I'd always thought these guys have something wrong up here. And uh, well, so the guys we hung out with in these bars, I never associated or thought that because they carry sacks on their backs or stuff like that, I didn't think they are street guys. I thought these are just guys who live in those slums that are near Isili, Kiamutisia, Madare, those kind of slums. So one day, we're at this place, uh, I have 30 bob, I am not drunk, I didn't make enough money, so I'm not drunk, but I have 30 bob for the lodging. And a friend of mine, a drinking buddy, walks in, tells me, hey, 
Taos, you buy me something. I live in Botswana, I have nothing. Only 30 bob and it's for accommodation. Guy tells me, ah, we don't worry, man. We'll sleep at my place, let's kunyu at this 30 bob. You know, I'm also thirsty. So I say, okay, let's kunyu. Kunyu at the 30 bob and at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, the Karobo place closes. So now, he's to leave. The guy puts his sack on his back. We walk up, anyone who knows this, Lee knows the place called St. Teresa's Dispensary. At that time, it was just being built. But next to it, there's a hardware that still exists up till today. I'll pass there sometimes. At this hardware, when we get to that veranda, the sack this guy has been carrying on his back, he puts it down. And I'm um, stand back, one, wondering what's with this guy? Kidogo, he fishes out some cartons, he starts to tandika them on the ground over there. And I'm shocked to ask him, boss, what's happening? Nini, nini. And uh, boss, wanna, watch our ass was to me fika base. Uh, you know, now <laughs> we have reached home, Ulajua, your alcohol just evaporates. That was the first, my first experience. So, you know, it was when I actually realized I was going to sleep on a veranda. You're in shock. Yes. You never thought it would get to this. Yes. But what are you going to do? It's 11 o'clock at night. It's past 11 o'clock at night and you have nothing. So, better sleep. At least these guys go and hear they sleep. They are still alive up to today. So, I said, okay, I'll just sleep that side of the wall. And the guy gave me... A cassack, pushed my feet into them, a piece of uh, plastic paper, funicard my head, and I slept. Now, Chokoras are kicked out of verandas at 5.30. So as soon as it reach 5.30, here's the watchman to get the upper, see, kwa mama zenu, nini, nini, a lot of food, you're waking us up. And you wake up and realize you are alive. Hala, okay, so a guy can sleep on the street. Now, the devil knows how to trap those who are already lost or losing it. Because when you are kicked off at 5.30 in the morning, the only open place, uh, kwa karobo kuna funguliwa at quarter to six. So in the few minutes when you are packing, packing your two things there, the only place you can go is the karobo place. So of course, I castigated myself for a few days after that. How? Me? How can I sleep on the street? Ah, pana, I was angry with myself. But a few days later, I, I was thirsty again. I didn't have enough money. I ended up on the same street. Long story short, I did a stint in the street. You sleep here two days. You go to the lodging for a bit. You sleep another two days, three days. Long story short, I eventually became a fully-fledged street person. I didn't see the need for paying for accommodation. I had got into that lifestyle. And... It happens gradually, but there I was. Once you get into being a full-fledged street person, chokura, it comes with a lot of problems. First comes the dirt, uchafu. You sleep on the veranda. This is, if it's rainy season, there is mud. If it is dry season, there is dust. So you are dirty. You sleep among other dirty guys. So in a short while, you are so dirty, you cannot go hustling anywhere. You, can, you can't go to hustle among decent people. So you join the street economy. You are introduced into the street economy. And I was introduced into the street economy. Uh, somebody helped me purchase a sack. I got 20 bob and somebody showed me uh, purchase a sack purchased a sack, and I was introduced into garbage collection. And I became a one-man garbage collection company. Because what at that time, and even now, the garbage collection in Isili was not very well organized. The Chokoras would go to homes, collect the garbage, find somewhere to dump it, and that's it. So what we did back then, you just go, you put your sack on your back, 
knock knock on this door somebody gives you their rubbish in a, a, a small bin there for five bob unaeka kwa gudia mwingine anakupatia for 10 bob you put in your gunia hivyo 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 by the time your uh, your bin uh, your sack is full you've got 50 bob sasa comes the next part of the plan sasa ni kuchengana na city council huko isili you know you need to dump you need to dump this thing you don't have you can't walk to dandora dumping sites man so you are going to dump it within the estate of isili and you know if you are caught dumping nobody jails chokoras they just beat you to within an inch of your life so that's a dangerous part but eventually you dump it now the way you are dirty you know a street person does not even have access to companionship of other people because of the way you look smell you look and smell nobody wants you near them so the only people you can go back to hang out with other street guys so you go back to the karobo place and all that became my life and i lived in that life for long but now look at the economic slide still happening 50 shillings is now the only money that you make in a day i've given you a budget already for what it took to drink 24 shillings alcohol 6 shillings cigarettes So that thirty bob is sacred. That thirty bob cannot is sacro sacro It cannot be touched because alcohol is the most important thing in your life at that time. It is all you live for. So you don't interfere with that budget, no matter whether it's for food. You'd better pick up dropped food somewhere, but you have your alcohol budget. So twenty bob is left. Your thirty bob you have expended out of the fifty. Twenty bob is left. Oh, ten bob unashika you go you look you rummage among nini uh, or just find anywhere dropped there used to be some plastic bags some green paper bags uh, that got banned by the government some time ago but they used to cost ten bob you just pick up one that has been thrown away they were common people used to litter with them the street sana so you pick up a paper bag and you go to the back of those uh, somali somali restaurants you give ten bob one of the members of the kitchen staff you go behind the kitchen there and you give 10 bob 10 and you give in your paper bag these guys have got a cabin there akaka pipa ndio kana tupwa all manner of whatever is left from the plates kama ni ugali kama ni whatever ugali macaroni chipo whatever is 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 the people have left over that is where they dump it sasa wewe hiyo ndio unawekewa kwa paper bag yako you remove the impurities and make a feast of what is inside there that was our food being entrepreneurial you know to maliza yote ukishiba whatever is left wewe na wewe you want to return on your investment so unachukua hiyo karatasi unaenda kuuzia chokora mwenzako yule hakupata nafasi ya kwenda kujichukuli kujichukulia that was life but again now with that life comes so many problems let me just give you a typical day in the life of achokora at 5:30 in the morning let's start from the wake up 5:30 in the morning you are woken up no scratch that you are kicked awake because the watchmen did not give you the veranda to sleep on because they love you These guys are only letting you sleep on that shop front because you are part of their security system. You are the alarm. If thieves come and they step on you guys in Tawika na watajua kuna 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 shida. The first thing as a chokura you do when you're kicked awake is to shake the sack that's next to you. You shake this sack. If it moves, it is alive. If it doesn't move, whatever is in there died in the night. And the only thing you can do is one guy grabs the feet, the sack the side of the feet, the other guy grabs the side of the head. Na mnaondoa hiyo gunia mnaweka pale barabarani pale city council itachukua. Maana you don't want to spoil the place where you guys you sleep. There are so many reasons. Chocolates die like flies and there are so many reasons why. Exposure to the elements, the diseases the bad food we eat the drinks that they take all this poison they are putting in this karubo and all of that and sometimes i think even the 
the lack of the will to, to live one. Because guys die like flies. It's if you don't have a guy dead in your base every week, a base is the community of Chokorazi in one particular spot. If a guy doesn't die in one week, oh, that, that, that is actually uh, <laughs> something to, it's something big. Now once you've done that, you now uh, get off the veranda and go to the Karobu place. Remember, it's not like you who wakes up and goes to wash your eyes and what in, in, in your personal hygiene. Where is a Chokora going to do that for? Where, where I, I would ask most people, even those who are watching me, do they, have they even ever given drinking water to Chokoras? So if they have never, how, where do they expect Chokoras would get water, you know, like to bathe their faces or etc. So that is totally unheard of, you know. Just get up, go to the Karobo place. If you had something left over from last night, you will drink Karobo. You get something to drink. By the time other people are going to work, some of you are already drunk. Alafu, when it reaches 8, 9 o'clock there, you go to people's house, collect garbage, uh, go dump it. And then because you, have, you, cannot associate, you cannot go anywhere else, you come back to the Karubo place and sit there to mingle with your fellow Chokoraz. But, and this I want to point out, because what I do is only related to the street man, not to street families. I want to point out the tribulations of the street man in society. Among the street families, there are three categories. There are the street children. All those kids that you see and uh, many of you love, you will throw 20 bob to them, you will give them something, to, uh, 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 you are to chips, you are eating, etc. Those ones are okay with society. There is the women, chokuras, especially those with babies on their backs. Those ones, you will, you know, you, you will buy for a pint, a pint of uh, milk and a loaf of bread. You sympathize with them. And then there is the male adult living in the streets, when he comes up to you, Namandevu Zaki, when he comes up to you in his rugs and his, and all you can see is the grime on the surface, and your first reaction is to take off, scream, judge this guy, long before you have even tried to understand this person. That's why I said in this conversation, I will try to be demystified. That way. Because I was one of them. And I know the rejection. And I know the rejection that men living on the streets go through. It is a life that no human being should live. And yet, those men on that street, they didn't fall from the skies. They are not the spawn of the devil. These are people who had families. They are fathers, they are grandfathers, they are brothers, they are sisters, they are brothers, they are cousins, they are ETC. So why does society, once they are on the streets, treat them as though they are the plague bearers or something like that, the way they avoid them? Let me mention something. Government features you nowhere in its plans ukiwa wanaume chokura mabarabarani. you don't feature anywhere. When government talks about the vulnerable, I would say even during COVID, when people were uh, contributing billions to assist the vulnerable in society, the vulnerable, according to society, is the guys living in the slums. I can tell you for free that the guys living in the various slums in and around Nairobi might as well be multi-millionaires compared to the life of a man living on the street. Those people there have access to water. Hata kama inatoka shilingitano, they can changanisha hapo na ibawatano na nunuwe yu mtungi. Therefore, they can become clean. They have a, a, a roof over their head. They are not living in the elements. Most importantly, they have access to companionship and 
interaction with other people. One thing the street man does not have. If a street man goes and stands by a newspaper stand where people are, are, are reading newspapers there, he will be quickly thrown away because people will think he's there to rob them, he's there to pickpocket them. They look at this thing and this thing can't read. I mean, when you look at it, it can't read. It must be literate. It must be just coming here to steal. Ondokapa. So the guy who is living in the slum is a million ways better off. He has access even to work. Now you'll take me and ask me, why doesn't the street man work? Understand, there are many things that, there are as many reasons as there are street men, why, why street men are there. Some, like us guys, alcoholism, drugs, nini, got us there. There are men who are on those streets. Products of uh, the, chi the child welfare system in this country. You see all these children's homes that exist. About 85 to 90% of them do not have an exit plan. And therefore, a child is rescued as a young child, taken through, and it's not their fault. It is not the, the, the fault of the children's homes. But I guess that's the law. A child is taken from the streets, rescued, taken to Primoni Ninini, put in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a street children's facility, and then just before the child turns 18, they are kicked out because the, the children's home has no uh, nini for dealing with, children, uh, with adults. So they cannot keep them there beyond 18. When they, when they channel them out, what's the plan? This kid, probably because they were rescued from the streets when they were a bit older, they have not completed school, so they don't have an education. They have not exactly reached 18, so they don't have an ID. Yet they go back to the street. And there are many men I can show you in the streets. And even today we still deal with many men in the streets who came from children's homes. Now, the thing is, when they get into those streets and become dirty, they suffer another problem. At the, age, at the attainment of 18 years and over, they are so dirty where they cannot, and they have no documents of their mothers or fathers, they cannot obtain an ID. Tell me what one thing you can do with, in this country without an ID. You can do nothing. You can't even register a, you cannot register even a, a, a SIM card if you don't have an ID. You can't get a job in this country if you don't have an ID. So that street man there is faced by the both things that he's so dirty, nobody wants him around him, he does not have an ID. And you are asking in your ignorance, you ask, sometimes it is good to try to understand some of the situations that some of these guys, I am not saying all, but some of the situations some of these guys go through. Sometimes those men are not walking up to you because they need your handout. Some of them would just like you to humanize them. Simply as a child of God. What does it cost you to just tell somebody, God loves you and has a great plan for you? Some of these people are not looking for your handout. They are just looking for a hand up out of their misery. Somebody to walk with them, somebody to help them to get out of their current existence. They made mistakes, yes, and they went to the streets, they have paid for those mistakes, but now they wish to come out. Why can't we be the people who help them to come out? So that was the kind of life we lived, and um, as I told you, it is a hard life. A chokura will take, because there is no water, uh, there is no water to bathe. So what happens is, you get very dirty, um, you're full of lice. I mean, the places you sleep, the sack you are sleeping in, the guy next to you has got lice, everybody around you has lice. So you get body lice, you get hair lice. In a short time, you have lice all over your body. And uh, maybe the first month, it's okay. We una kunywa kabisa karobo, chawazako zinalewa, unalewa, mnalala. 
second month now you are even no more, you are drinking like in chawa easy as ilali bana by the third month it does not matter how much you are drinking these things have so crowded your body that they are not giving you space now that's the time now you are actually doing bodily harm to yourself una cheza guitar uskumzima you know how you scratch yourself you are sweating you have got maybe like three layers of clothing you start putting wounds on yourself sasa chawa zimezidi now it's the day to go bath you buy your kaba of soap you have to look for a tin am kebe get that mkebe uh unaenda you tafuta also some to plastic some to pieces of plastic along the way to light a good fire and you go to the river sasa hapo ndo unaenda unatoa this mkebe is for boiling your clothes sasa unaenda unatoa nguo zako zote you stuff them in this mkebe put water later ka three stone fire there and boil rice i'm not shrubbing boil rice kuchemsha chawa mwanaume mzima ambaye ako na akili hajarogwa ukishamaliza pale kuchemsha chawa you wait then as the chawa is boiling you you go and take uh, you also go get into the river you wash yourself off kidogo and then uh, once they've boiled things are white you why wipe them off your clothes na vangu za kotena zinakuja zikikaukia njiani and as you on the way back but every chokora you know knows that you have bathed because that day eh leta eh no umar way everyone knows you have come from the river but you have bathed you know it's a, it's a life it's a life human beings should not live then i lived i lived that life until uh, you so you see death you are tired of this life and eventually at one point in time i i you know you seen so many guys who are dying uh, that you don't want your life somehow for me i always never wanted my life to end that way on one particular day a guy gave me some clothes and i decided to go to the river this is there towards the end of 99 and uh I went to the river I bathed and I decided I would go home I would retrace my way home remember I had isolated myself from people I had then gone on to lead my own life eventually things had messed up I had gone to the streets so it had been almost 10 years I'd by then I'd been in the street almost 3 years but I decided I would go not so much not so much that these guys at the were going to go and make up but more because i would rather go kill myself there a loose plan not not too solid plan at the back of my mind was you know when you get there you can end it there and then these guys will bury you at that time my father's last known address was uh on george padmo road in kilimani i wasn't sure whether he has moved and i said i'll go Imagine how my mind was that even after bathing and putting on those clothes I didn't have bath fear yes but even if I had had bath fear I don't think I could have caught a matatu because at that time my mind was so beaten down to kura thinking where you can't even get into public transport I walked to Kilimani I got there I went to the gate and i knocked and asked the watchman you know, do the kilanga still live here he says yes hey, musa kilanga here yes ah musa kilanga is my kid brother so he goes and um, he calls musa now it's been 10 years i left my kid bro at about 9 or 10 years there uh, the guy who comes out of that gate is a huge fellow but has changed man but okay comes out we have a hard time kidogo recognizing each other but kidogo we we get talking we are brothers to kaongea and um said you no know, is father in the house yeah but let's do this let's take a walk so that we can catch up eh? remember i'm the first born this is the last born there's a sister in between us so i want to catch up and know so what has been happening first of all this guy is 19 they are all going to 20 he's already done his private pilot's license like my father my father was a pilot like my father he's decided to go into piloting he's done his private pilot's license in another two months this guy is going to go to the states to do his commercial pilot's license i ask about my sister 
um, my sister Rita Kitambo, she left the country, went to America, went to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, she finished her studies, uh, got married, got a child, she lives in Illinois, Chicago. And what about the first boy? The guy who was Bembele's one like uh, something else, my Apombele, me, Ama Chukura. We are only three. You know, there is, at that point it hits you, just how much life has moved on. Your siblings, your younger siblings have moved on. There is no space, nowhere in any conceivable universe where you can tell me that even as the firstborn, I would ever been I would ever have been able to say anything in front of these two. As a what? Mini chokura. But that only hardened my resolve. See, remember I told you at the back of my mind, I had a plan that I could end it all. And because for every addict, for every person going through some really tough places, there are people who play with this kind of thing of, if it really gets bad, then I have one last bullet, I'll, I'll just take my life, you know? I'll just bring this suffering to an end. I mean, I, I had that in my mind. Now, I can't tell my brother I'm living in the streets. So I cook up, uh, concoct a story, oh, I'm living in some, you know, some low-class area, you know, finances have been a bit hard. I cannot say I'm living in the street, I would rather say I'm living in some slums, man. But I told him, you know, about this uh, rat infestation that has happened in my neighborhood. I need to buy some rat poison, you know, when I go home, I need to deal with some rats. Nanini. So um, I got him convinced as we were walking around Adam's Arcade and we bought four sachets of uh, rat poison. This was for me to go home and exterminate the rodents at my place. That's the story I fed him. But in reality, this was what I was going to use to try to take my life. So we hung out together at around 7 o'clock, um, almost close to 7 o'clock. We start walking back. Uh, we have walked back. We are, near, uh, we are near home there. And he goes home to bring me something. But where we are at, there's a kiosk there. So I ask for a glass of water, a cup of water, and he give me the water. So when he's gone, I quickly tear these four sachets. And let me tell you, I was convinced I was going to die. I had seen a guy drink, those things were called red cut. I had seen a guy drink the same thing in the streets. You know, guys would get tired of life. I'm trying to come here. Ah, me, I'm tired. In fact, you guys encourage him. You, you end it. I'd seen a guy drink two sachets of red cut in the morning. He was not there. So I was sure four, four would finish my life. So I mixed them held the empty sachets and I waited for him to come. My brother came back and I drank the concoction, tossed the things at him and told him, now bury me.